Hi there, this is Judy Marie from the DG Marie Trust in South Africa. You are about to watch a video presentation which will explain basic concepts around indicators which we use when we monitor and evaluate social programs. This video forms part of other resources offered on our Growing Confidence website, which is aimed at assisting nonprofit organizations to develop their monitoring and evaluation systems. Let's start by defining what we are talking about. What are indicators? I hope the picture has done its bit and said a thousand words and that you instantly understood that an indicator is something that points to the occurrence of something else. We cannot directly observe social phenomena or concepts, yet we know it exists and is present or absent under certain circumstances. And how do we know this? We look at indicators. Let's look at the concept of social cohesion or a sense of happiness and togetherness or camaraderie in communities as an example. We cannot actually see the concept of social co cohesion, but we know social cohesion is present or absent through the following indicators. What people report about trusting others in their community. High levels of trust is associated with high levels of social cohesion and low levels vice versa. By how satisfied they say they are with life, we might also look at the suicide rate here, the presence or absence of pro-social behavior, for example, are community members volunteering, helping strangers and donating money, as well as the voting rates. High voting rates would indicate that people care and want to participate in the management of their community. So now that we have defined the concept of indicators, let me explain to you the typical characteristics or attributes of indicators that we use for measurement in social programs. Firstly, you should know that indicators are imperfect. Let's think back to the social cohesion example, where we said that indicators for social cohesion are trust, life satisfaction, pro-social and voting behavior in communities. Perhaps you can point out more indicators of social cohesion or you would like to challenge these ones. That is an important aspect of indicators to be aware of. Indicators are approximations. They are imperfect and they vary in their validity and their reliability. Sometimes a single indicator is not sufficient to say that a certain change has occurred or that a phenomenon is present or absent. For example, High voting rates on its own won't necessarily imply high social cohesion. In fact, it might imply the opposite. People might have been coerced to vote. In these cases, you will need to add additional indicators and thereby develop a set of indicators, like I've listed for social cohesion, that together illustrate the occurrence or absence of the phenomena. The next characteristic. Indicators can be shared. Indicators are sometimes obvious. For, exa for example, an indicator for a decrease in school dropout would be the school graduation rate. However, other times it can be complex and require a lot of research to identify and develop the indicator or indicator sets. It is in our interest to develop standard indicators of social phenomena which are used whenever people are trying to measure this phenomenon. This allows us to compare the information across different programs, geographical areas and implementation circumstances. You will see that in many fields, health and economics for example, standard indicators have been developed and it is only a question of selecting an appropriate one. If you are doing something unique though, you will need to identify your own indicators. Number three, the purpose of indicators is to measure. We look at indicators to answer the question, is it there or did it happen? That's the point of using indicators in evaluation is to help us observe and to measure change. Did something happen that did not happen before? To what extent did it happen? Was the change big or small? How often is it happening? Is the change sustained or not? To answer these questions implies the counting and comparison of quantities at different points of t in time. Therefore, indicators are generally expressed in terms of numbers or percentages. The number of, the percent of, the ratio of, the incidence of, the proportion of. Researchers would say it is quantitative. Now, sometimes people refer to qualitative indicators when they are measuring phenomena 
which they would define as qualitative or describing a certain quality, for example, like feeling happy. And then they would refer to quantitative indicators when they're referring to something they can obviously count, like the number of brochures that they distributed. However, the reason why indicators are generally expressed in quantitative terms is not related to the nature of the phenomena that you are investigating. It is because the type of questions that we are trying to answer through indicators requires counting. It happened, yes or no. It happened to a large extent or it barely happened. That does not mean that qualitative information is not useful to evaluation, but it answers different questions like why did something happen or what is the nature of something? And therefore it is not expressed as indicators. So this means that when you are selecting indicators, you need to be sure that there are ways of measuring or counting the occurrence of the indicator. For example, Levels of happiness is generally established through life satisfaction surveys and scales where people rate the extent of their feelings of happiness on numbered scales. For example, zero would mean you are extremely unhappy or five would mean you are extremely happy and then everything in between. Right, then finally, there are three things that complement indicators. The first one is targets. This is basically benchmarking. How much change will be enough to achieve the impact that you hope your program will achieve? For example, if you offer a skills training course that capacitate people to find employment, isn't sufficient if only two out of 10 of them find employment? Or would you say your program has achieved this outcome when at least seven or eight out of 10 of them find employment? Because change or social phenomena can occur uh, in quantities ranging between a lot and a little, it is important that you qualify at which level of change you would say that your program has successfully achieved an outcome. Because you are using an indicator to establish or measure whether the change has happened, your targets will need to relate to your indicators. The next thing that complements your indicators is a baseline. If you want to establish whether something has changed, you need to compare it to how it, it, it was before your intervention. This means you need to know its status before your intervention. We call that a baseline. Basically, a baseline entails that you do all the measurements for a selected number of indicators or outcomes that are key to illustrate that your intervention is achieving what it is set out to do before you start implementing your program and that you keep those numbers on record for future comparison during evaluation. You can also use these numbers to determine which level of change will be necessary to achieve your impact. In other words, to inform your targets. And then lastly, a comparison group. So it is fine to establish where the change has happened using indicators and targets and baselines. But how do you know that this change happened as a result of your intervention? In some cases, it is obvious and there might be no need to investigate it further. For example, your program established a children's hospital in a needy area and as a result, more children are receiving medical care when they need it. But especially with interventions with less concrete outcomes, it becomes difficult to say that your program is responsible for the change. In other words, that your program is effective or at least that your program has contributed to the change. Take, for example, a program designed to improve a love of reading, which is measured by the number of books that children say they read in a month. If the program notices an increase in the number of books read compared to the baseline, it could be as a result of their program. But suppose at the same time the SABC started broadcasting another program that also promotes reading or Department of Education improved school libraries. We thus cannot really be sure that the change was due to our program. The best way to establish attribution or contribution would be to look for the occurrence of your indicators in two groups. The one group is the target group that you are working with and the second group is a group that you know for certain has had no exposure to your program, but yet they are very similar to the group that you've been working with. So researchers would call the second group a control group. And this process of comparison they would call quasi-experimental or true experimental research. 
We hope that this video has assisted you to understand the basic concepts around the use of indicators to measure the progress and effectiveness of social programs. You can also read and download or print the text for this video on the Growing Confidence website. We provide a link for the site in the video description below. On this site, we take you systematically through the information that you need to know and the steps that you need to take to identify and formulate indicators for your program. So have a look. Thank you for watching and listening.